I'm Jennifer Isabella. And I'm Srividya Sridharan. Your co-host for Forrester's podcast, What It Means, where we explore the latest market dynamics impacting executives and their customers. Today, we're joined by analyst Rowan Curran to discuss a very hot topic right now, generative AI. Welcome, Rowan. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be back. I feel like you might be back a few more times on this topic, (laughs) thanks to something called ChatGPT. Um, Now, because of that, we know that a lot of people know what generative AI is, but let's talk about what it isn't. So maybe let's start with the definition of generative AI and then talk about some common myths and misconceptions. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, first off, we can look at generative AI uh, it's important to look at it as both a much broader, um, but also a much uh, more specific space than most people think about. So, obviously, the vast majority of the public's attention over the past couple of months has been on ChatGPT, which is a application that is built on top of generative AI technology, but it is not uh, generative AI in and of itself. So, when we're talking about uh, generative AI, we're talking about the models um, that underlie. Uh, these applications, whether they're large language models or whether they're generative adversarial networks. And then the uh, generation piece is the ability to create text, audio files, uh, uh, images, and uh, video on top of these things. And what they are not doing is they are not creating net new information, especially on the text side, that has a contextual understanding of itself. So these models are essentially predicting what is the next word in a sequence of words based upon uh, the previous words in that sequence. Now, this can result in very, very compelling uh, communications. You know, we've seen a lot of examples of this, um, both, you know, uh, probably personally with our interactions with ChatGPT as well as in the press. Um, You know, ultimately, those are not actually, you know, uh, self-aware cogent conversations. That is the model trying to guess what the next best word is. And the next best word in a context like this is what the human wants to see. So essentially, these things are people pleasers overall. So it's important when we're using them to not treat them as, you know, sources of authority or oracles or any type of, you know, mind behind them. It's really important to treat them as software tools that we can use to better Um, build applications to enhance the way we find knowledge and to uh, produce content as well. They're very, very useful, but it's important to not project too many uh, internal states upon them. So what are the most common myths? Um, You know, clearly there is a lot of nuance of what it is and what it isn't. Um, And as you said, the chat GPT uh, conversation has overtaken. And so what about images? What about video? What about audio, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about what myths and misconceptions exist about what generative AI is or should be. Yeah, so I'll take the image space to start with, because I think there's been a lot of attention around this and a lot of discussion. Um, And thankfully, the discussion is actually moving forward right now. Um, So in the generative image space, this traditionally was based off of a technique called generative adversarial networks, which basically used uh, two... uh, models running against each other to try and determine what was a uh, a reasonable to create image and what was not reasonable based upon the underlying data set. Uh, now we have diffusion models that basically create images from a random set of pixels based upon the training data. And there's been a lot of discussion about that underlying training data and where it comes from and who uh, is being compensated for it and who is actually part of the conversation around this training data. And this has led to you know, a number of lawsuits that me- you may have seen. Um, cur- uh, Getty is suing Stable Diffusion in the UK. There's a couple class action lawsuits uh, against uh, providers here in the US. But uh, what I think is really important here is that you know this big conversation is around, okay, if we're going to build these image generation models, how do we actually keep traditional artists part of that conversation and not, you know, completely throw them out onto the street. And uh, today, um, March 21st, and I want to be very clear that today is March 21st, so everything I'm talking about is as of today. We saw Adobe release um, the beta of their Firefly product, which I think is really notable in terms of how it moves this conversation forward uh, around compensating artists and supporting them in a world where generative AI is just going to be part of the artistic landscape. Like, 
that's just the way it is. The genie's out of the bottle. We're moving forward on that. And so what Adobe has done is basically allowed artists to opt in to uh, contributing their works in the stock photo gallery to training their image model. And uh, Adobe essentially owns all of the IP information around that uh, image content. So there's no question of, you know, stealing artist's work or taking it without permission to produce new content. And then the content that is produced can then be, you know, put up on Adobe's stock site and relicensed and shared and such things. And you can see something somewhat similar coming from Shutterstock, where they have their uh, creator fund, which is designed to compensate artists who have contributed uh, photos to their stock photo gallery that is then uh, given as part of the data sets to both Stable Diffusion and OpenAI and others to uh, train their large language models. But uh, in addition to kind of the, that just standard, you know, text to image generation space, we also have a lot of very interesting activity going on in the uh, multi-modal um, large language model space. So uh, when OpenAI announced GPT-4 last week, there was discussion um, and they announced that this would be a multimodal language model that would be able to run queries both off of images and text, though we didn't see that um, in the current implementation in ChatGPT+. Uh, but it's not just you know OpenAI around this. There's some really interesting papers that have been published that look at using images both as a prompt and as an output of these models. So I think in the next you know six, eight months, we're going to start to see models uh, that allow you to interact um, in a conversational format uh, with images or that allow you to uh, do things like submitting a sequence of images and then asking the uh, model to complete it. So you could see how that would be very useful in scenarios like doing uh, process modeling or in you know, uh, determining if there was uh, some kind of um, defect in a manufacturing plan or something like that. Basically doing these uh, tasks that were traditionally limited to more specific um, computer vision models now being able to be accessed uh, through large language models as well. So clearly the space is moving at a lightning speed um, and sounds like the excitement is around the multimodal, you know, sensory aspect of image and text and video. What are you most excited about, um, especially given all of these recent developments? Yeah, so it's funny. So I, I've had a number of conversations about ways I think the space is going to move forward this year, and we've already had a, a couple of those um, already start to happen. So the first is the advent of these multimodal large language models. Um, I think that once we have the ability to run these uh, at a pretty quick speed on relatively small footprints, this is really going to uh, again, move forward how we do research and uh, uncover knowledge because that will allow us to uh, interact with data in uh, multiple different formats, which is you know the way that we have our content. So you'll um, be able to you know submit a image of something um, to your search engine, and get a contextual response based upon that. We already have the beginnings of that in some cognitive search solutions, but this is really going to move the space forward there. And you can also see uh, you know within that. Uh, in the kind of chat conversation um, and uh, an interaction where maybe you would generate an image and then iterate it on it through a chat conversation, like say, um, you know, create me an image of a, a a schnauzer dog that is wearing, you know, an Easter suit. And then, you know, in the next iteration, say, oh, no, I don't want, you know, a pastel colored Easter suit. I want a, you know, bright lime green um, Easter suit. Or no, actually, I want a St. Patrick's Day suit or something like that. So you can basically think about how you can iterate through these uh, type of image generation or text generation um, capabilities with, um, with conversation with images through the multimodal large language models. The other thing that I'm very excited about in this space is the advent of being able to run uh, large language models and, you know, any other type of generative uh, AI capability like a diffusion model or whatever else on your local machine, um, like a laptop or a desktop, or even getting that to the, the footprint size of being able to run it on a smartphone. And we've, you know, we've seen the glimmerings of this uh, start in the past couple of weeks. So we had Meta release a set of models um, called Llama, uh, basically for research purposes. So you could download them and ask for the parameters from Meta and they would send them to you so you could kind of investigate how the model would work. And there happened to be a leak of some of these uh, or of the parameters. And, uh, you know, hobbyist developers being who they are, they immediately jumped on it. And uh, there was it was demonstrated that you could run Llama in the 7 billion parameter model size um, for about uh, 30 gigabytes with 30 gigabytes of memory and 10 gigabytes of RAM, um, which, you know, is a that's a high end laptop um, in terms of the RAM. But 
or not high end, but you know, it's a, it's a reasonably powerful r- laptop in terms of the RAM, but that's still something you could do on your local machine, and you don't necessarily have to have you know a cloud server with tons of GPUs to do that. So. Uh, even though that is, you know, just a research version, and we can't actually do this in a commercial uh, type of scenario yet, this really is pointing to the way to how interesting the implementations of these models could be. Because right now, a lot of our use cases are limited by the fact that they have to be run um, in the cloud somewhere. So you know, there's you know, uh, latency and um, call and response times and stuff like that. So if we can start to get these down to smaller sizes, then not only could we have you know better performance, but also we could start to think about having personally trained large language models. So think about having you know uh, your Siri or Cortana or Google Assistant being driven by a large language model that is also uh, fine tuned on all of the questions and answers that you personally have asked it over the years. You had uh, alluded to some use cases, right? So maybe can you explore a few more of the use cases from a commercial or enterprise perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So the first use case that I'm seeing at many companies, and I think this is probably going to be one of the most uh, useful short and midterm use cases, is knowledge support. And that, uh, you know, is really all the use cases around how do we take the knowledge based content that we have either in our, you know, enterprise search system and our customer support and um, uh, care system, and how do we make that more easily digestible by the users that need to use that? So we're seeing folks that are using large language models to take uh, their you know, very lengthy policy documents and break those into more atomic parts and then uh, create summaries from those atomic parts to serve up to their customer service reps so that they don't have to go and you know, read through lengthy PDFs when interacting with someone updating their contract. We're also seeing folks that are you know, turning their uh, customer um, question and answer sets on their website um, into the fine-tuning basis for a large language model so um, that their customers can have a natural uh, query interface with this model, but it's not actually trying to go into the underlying large language model to get that information. So you don't have the as much of an issue with hallucinations. It's primarily using the... Um, the fine tuning layer to get those answers. And then, you know, we were also seeing folks that are just using this for uh, kind of, you know, a front end uh, customer experience support. So uh, CarMax is a client of um, Microsoft's OpenAI service, and they are currently using it to summarize vast sets of uh, customer written reviews into a synthetic review that combines. Uh, a summary of all of the content that the humans have written. So that appears first on the page, and then you can kind of read into the detailed ones if you want to, but it's essentially allowing you to gain the knowledge of all those people who've written their reviews without having to read through every individual one. That is a lot of um, uh, varied use cases, right? Knowledge workers, security teams, content marketers, um, data science teams. Is generative AI going to over democratize AI within the enterprise? I mean, think about the conversation of AI, maybe 2016, um, 2017, still a very specialized um, implementation or use of AI within the enterprise. But, you know, this is this is different. Um, so what are some of the risks of this over democratization um, of AI within the enterprise, if any? So I think the risks really come from a lot of the same issues that we've had around other types of data and analytics uh, programs over the past several years. But there's also some new risks involved with this as well. So, you know, uh, over the past, you know, five, 10 years, as we've been implementing more and more uh, predictive analytics capabilities into various enter- pieces of enterprise software, a big challenge around that has been, how do we actually, you know, do the change management to migrate people over to this new system and make them trust it? And, Uh, You know, we kind of overcame that by, you know, running systems in parallel, showing people the different results, and they became accustomed to using these uh, predictive systems. I think now as we are moving into a space where uh, we are using large language models uh, to produce content to uh, be part of our application systems, there's this additional layer of not only needing to be uh, all right with, you know, uh, variable predictions from predictive analytics, but being able to or being comfortable with and also being able to account for systems that will produce non-deterministic results. So large language models are predictive models at their core, which essentially means that uh, when you, unless you tune them specifically to produce you know, a one-to-one result, which is not actually useful from a model, um, they're con- going to produce slightly different results even based upon the same prompt um, over time. So when 
folks, uh, developers and QA managers and uh, folks of, of those stripes are looking at these systems, they really need to think about how do we test and account for this variability here. And so one of the ways that uh, folks are looking at this um, is they are doing uh, post hoc content moderation. So basically when these large language models generate content, they have a human and or another language model review that content and highlight, you know, factual claims um, that might need to be reviewed, any, you know, offensive turns of phrase or, you know, even stuff that is just not in line with the um, the enterprise uh, brand identity that they want to project. Uh, but then, you know, there's also the need to um, really think about, okay, uh, how are we putting the system into place? So, uh, when we're talking to clients and anybody suggests, you know, creating a customer facing chat bot that has the ability to kind of generate content arbitrarily, uh, that immediately raises a huge red flag for me. And I um, call a stop to the conversation so we can talk that through, because currently the risk of generating content uh, that may have a negative effect on your brand, if you're allowing users to create uh, or you're allowing these systems to create arbitrary content with no human in the loop is very, very high. So as folks are looking at using these systems, you know, I think it's a great use case to use the language model to, you know, uh, summarize uh, search results that are coming back or to, uh, you know, do offline uh, summarization or uh, concatenation of information. But at query time, you really should have either a human in the loop or you should not be generating new content um, at the moment of query. So sounds like it's, um, you know, the entire life cycle from beginning to monitoring uh, of these models and post, post launch as well, right? I mean, there's a continuous aspect to understanding, are they working? Are they doing, you know, what they're supposed to do? What's the business result? What's the impact? What's the, you know, who are the stakeholders in this mix? Customers, employees, so it's a much more well-rounded approach to governance, if you will. Yes, and there's one additional aspect to this as well, which I think is a it's currently a challenge for um, some enterprises, and uh, it didn't get made better by some of the announcements last week. And this is the need to be able to uh, do your due diligence on the data sourcing uh, for the training of these models. So uh, large language models says so right on the tin. They're very large and they're trained on huge corpuses of data, like many, many, many terabytes of data. And so having an understanding of what that data is, even, you know, just what data sets it come from, like whether it comes from the pile or whether it comes from, you know, uh, uh, you know, books one or books two or some of these other, you know, known data sets is very important. And one of the announcements last week uh, that some people are um, feeling a little bit nervous about it, is the announcement of GPT-4 and the fact that no parameters or weights around the model were released um, with that announcement. And those parameters and weights are really important for researchers and for enterprises to understand why the model is responding to certain prompts the way that it is. And so I think it's very important for enterprises to have some type of strategy, testing, and contingency plan around um, the outputs of these models, particularly if they're not able to use one that they can uh, vet all of the data um, that is underlying it. Especially for high-risk use cases, I imagine. Yes. Things like and, and that doesn't mean that you need to, to vet every single piece of data. Like there's many applications that enterprises use today where they trust their vendor because they're a trusted vendor to provide them with a model that does what they expect them to do. They use it in forecasting applications. It's used in, you know, uh, customer churn applications and things like that. So I don't think this is necessarily a difference in kind here, but it is certainly a place that people need to pay extra attention to that uh, due diligence around the data and the third party risk. I mean, you had mentioned governance, right? This I'm just sort of env envisioning like a shadow AI situation of like shadow IT back in the day? Or is there concern about that where teams will just be going and kind of jumping at the next shiny object? Or are we confident that existing governance structures in place are going to do what they should be doing? So I think we are actually uh, experiencing the downside of that right now. So um, I've spoken to a number of our clients uh, where, you know, a great many of their employees are uh, super excitedly starting to use chat GPT, whether it's the free public version or whether it's the paid public version for work. 
And that is a, that's a pretty dangerous thing for people to be doing at enterprises. Um, we, when you have the paid version or the free version of ChatGPT through OpenAI, the data that you send up to them is out of your control. Um, it is part of their reinforcement learning layer. They now have access to it. So if you send any proprietary or otherwise, you know, um, controlled information to them, it is now completely out of your jurisdiction and, um, you know, kind of out there in the wild. So when we're speaking to clients, you know, I, kind of the first thing is to make sure that they either uh, shut down the use of chat GPT on their corporate networks, um, which doesn't preclude people from using it on their phones. So if they're if they still want to play around with it, they can. Um, you just don't want to make it super easy for them to just use this content as part of their normal workflow. Um, but I think that that's going to die down. Uh, I would expect over the next, you know, six months or a year or so. Um, especially as we are having such a a energetic race towards embedding these capabilities within the you know the most common. Uh, office productivity suites that people use. They'll be available use. soon within the work, yeah, existing workflow. Yeah, so we've got it in Google Workspaces. We've got it in Microsoft 365. You know, I expect to see this in, you know, WordPress and Canva and pretty much every other uh, major word processing or um, content generation uh, software over the next six months or years. So I think that that need to go to an outside tool that is unapproved will reduce just because the, the speed at which this is starting to pervade other capabilities is very, very quick. And that was kind of the problem with the shadow IT thing, right? Was people wanted these capabilities and IT wasn't able to move quickly enough to actually adopt those capabilities. Whereas today, I think, you know, it's not even IT that has to move fast enough. It's the vendors are running towards this as fast as they can to get this capability implemented. Basically from experimentation to more embedded mm-hmm. use, which yes. will become a way of working. Yeah. And, and not keeping them as standalone tools necessarily. I think that, you know, we will continue to have a market for these standalone content generation tools, but uh, it's going to be a lot easier for a lot of folks to have it just, you know, in line with the tools that you're already using as part of your workday. So obviously we've been talking, we've been talking here so much about the technology. There's a lot of talk, you know, out in the marketplace, but what is maybe one thing, one big thing you think that people aren't talking enough about or, or talking at all about as it relates to generative AI? I think the biggest thing that is not a prominent part of the conversation is the the lowering of the bar to entry for malicious actors to do bad things with these models. And particularly, uh, we can look at this in the space of prompt injection attacks, which were kind of uh, highlighted as a major risk uh, last fall. I think that there's been significant work done Uh, around the shaping of how you interact with these models to reduce the risk around those prompt injection attacks. But I think that there is a a much greater risk coming from the uh, spam and phishing um, space over the next year or two. So, you know, spear phishing attacks, um, you know, when you target a specific individual with personal information, you know, you really know them, you can do social engineering to kind of get them to do what you want them to do. That becomes much, much easier when you can use a large language model to say uh, not just, you know, fake a professional looking email, but then you can easily generate an entire website um, that exists behind that link that has legitimate sounding content talking about, you know, various types of products in a kind of generic but reasonable sounding way. You can generate images, not just of, you know, uh, like uh, Zen images for the products and the services, but also of the people. You can create an entire fictional board using large language models and generative adversarial networks or diffusion models. You could even create, uh, you know, the subsequent websites of those board members um, for other areas that they work at. So you can really create these very complex ecosystems of misinformation at scale with a much lower bar of entry. So, you know, I think there's a big danger, like I said, from, you know, spear phishing attacks and spam. And I also think that the broader information space, whether we're talking about, you know, politics uh, or social conflict or, um, you know, kinetic conflicts, I think that the uh, impact of large language models on um, adding more noise to these spaces is going to be very significant. And I don't think that we have really good tools to discern um, the signal from that noise right now. So it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out over the next couple of years. 
Sounds like another podcast episode to me, <laughs> Rowan. Definitely not the last time we're going to be talking about this topic. Certainly not. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. If you like what you heard today, subscribe to Forrester's What It Means podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast player. To continue the conversation, follow Forrester on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, or drop us a note at podcast at Thanks for listening.